for your We are often treated as untouchable during our periods. not easy because a woman is not supposed to talk in front of men in this community. But I knew fighting female genital mutilation, it takes time. The strategy we use is education. I want the girls of next generation to be free of superstitious beliefs that isolate and humiliate them. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Jennifer Ashton. Uh, these are hard acts to follow. It's been an incredible day. This will be an incredible panel. Uh, this week, as many of you know, New York announced a state of emergency due to a measles outbreak. And largely because of anti-vaccination fears, measles infections are spiking across this country. And this really shows us that no matter where we are in the world, what we believe our feelings about health and medicine and science really does have a significant impact on our health outcomes. And we know and we've seen that health emergencies unfortunately tend to disproportionately affect women and girls. Uh, so today I'm honored to moderate this panel about taboos, traditions in the past, present, and future. Um, with me today are Shalini, Elizabeth, Gunit, and Edna, real pioneers um, for women's health around the world. And uh, I think you're gonna be very, very impressed with what they have to say. So Elizabeth, I'd like to start with you. Uh, as a senior advisor to the uh, UN Women, you've seen firsthand how gender roles and gender inequality uh, around the world have a very real impact on the health and lives of women. Whether that's through sexual or domestic violence, uh, which we hear more about, or child marriage, uh, which has direct consequences uh, to health, often leading to severe complications in pregnancy and death for these girls and young women. Gender really is a linchpin uh, in many ways for the safety and health of women. Now, you grew up in Zimbabwe. Indeed. And uh, you mentioned backstage that it's unusual for you to be wearing white. You, you sh <laughs> said you should be wearing more colorful, um, that you look beautiful. So can you describe for us a, a way that you personally have seen women's health affected by gender inequality and connect those dots for us? Yes, yeah, so I grew up in a small village in Zimbabwe and I was raised by my grandmother. And there was a very interesting dynamic that I saw where I saw women do all the hard work and men make all the important decisions. It was the men who decided whether the woman should go and seek medical help. It was the men who decided how many children the family ought to have. It was a man who decided, again, it was during the era of, of, of the HIV AIDS pandemic in my own country in Zimbabwe, and again, I saw women be deprived of access to even testing as well as medication. But I think for me, the biggest takeaway is after I left Africa, I realized this was not an issue for women in Africa. It was a universal issue because everywhere in most countries around the world, including here in the U.S., these challenges are so prominent. Reproductive health is a questionable thing that continues to be debated. Um, again, without even taking into account what the woman herself needs, we have seen maternal mortality continue to be a big issue, including here in the U.S. So for me, I think the biggest takeaway is that there is so much that needs to, to be done in terms of healthcare for women because there is this gender dimension that makes it much more difficult for women to access services, but also to access their rights to access those, those services. Absolutely, and Edna, um, as the former first lady of Somalia, you, when you retired from your position with the World Health Organization, 
Um, you obviously didn't like having a lot of free time, so you started <laughs> a maternity hospital in Somalia, uh, which has been so transformative in that community. But you've also been a very powerful and vocal av advocate against female genital mutilation in Somalia and have made incredible strides to reducing that. Um, but it has been a very slow process. Why do you think those communities are so resistant to changing that practice? Uh, well, thank you very much. Well, first of all, I come from Somaliland, so there is a slight confusion between Somalia and former British Somaliland protectorate. Uh, I retired from the UN after a long career, and at a time when my country had just emerged from a long civil war, everything was destroyed. Uh, people had spent 10, 11 years in civil war uh, and mostly in refugee camps. And the only things that people have can hold on to is their tradition, good or bad. Some cultures, some traditions are good, but then because of the, uh, the, the likelihood of rape and violence against women, the issue of female genital mutilation or female circumcision or infibulation uh, became reinstated into the practice of the community as a way of protecting their daughters from rape. So whatever gains we had made in the past to convince people to abandon the practice, after the war, we found that people had picked up their habit again. Um, they're resistant to it because nobody's had time to tell them any different. It took me a long time for me to find out that female circumcision was not a religious requirement. Yeah. It was a cultural, traditional practice. Many Islamic communities do not circumcise their, their, their daughters. And um, it, was, it was a tradition that had lasted for so long, for centuries and for generations, that they held on to it. So when one tries to convince the population about the, the, the harmful effects of the practice, it, it becomes a very difficult uh, subject to, to, to introduce. Um, you're talking about genitals, you're talking about private parts of the woman you don't normally talk about. So in itself, it's a taboo subject. So you need to bring in your credibility. You need to bring in the confidence that the people have in you. You need to speak the language that the people can tolerate to listen to. You speak about hemorrhage, everybody knows that. Infections, pain, suffering, inability to conceive because of all the pelvic inflammation that happens in the girl. These, are th th these become the way that you can introduce the subject. Yes, body integrity is, is good, but my grandmother would understand that. Um, you would understand about the rights of women to their own body. My grandmother will understand that. But when I talk about bleeding, when I talk about hemorrhage, when I talk about inability to pass urine like everybody else, she will have, she will be able to, to relate to that and listen to me. So one needs to be convincing, credible, and also approach it in a way that you can win, convince, gain, credibility in what you're doing. For instance, I'm a midwife. I go to work in the morning. I need to get a baby out from a part of the body that has been very damaged and mutilated. Everybody understands that I need to cut, I need to suture. That woman bleeds, she has pain. Every woman who's had a baby has gone through it. So these are the ways that you go, you, 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 you approach, or you begin to speak about these problems. And then each thing also becomes reinforced by the level of education of the audience you're speaking to. And an audience that I target very strongly is the father. The father is the head of the family. So why turn your back and say, oh, this is a woman's issue, yeah. but she is your daughter. You have the right and the responsibility to protect your daughter. So th that's how we try to, to approach it. And luckily for the first time, we're seeing, a dim we're seeing a dip. 25% of the women who deliver in my hospital have only had the mild, I won't say only the mild, have had the type one or type two. 
and none of, none of it can be minimized to be described as mild. It shouldn't happen. But at least the most severe form has been, is beginning to be abandoned. And that's a real step in the right direction, obviously. And, and you, what you just mentioned about trust is a perfect segue to my question for Shalini. Uh, in 2014, you worked on the re Ebola response in West Africa. We just heard about it um, recently in a, in a previous panel. Uh, there was recent news just a couple of days ago um, about record cases right now in the DRC. Part of the issue that I'd like you to speak to us about is mistrust, distrust uh, between the community there and the healthcare providers on the ground who are trying to address, treat, and prevent and curtail this epidemic. So speak to us a little bit about that if you could. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, every epidemic has its own social, cultural, political, economic context. Um, but what's a common thread, what's remarkable to me uh, from the experience that I had um, during the Ebola crisis in 2014 and seeing what is, um, what is happening now is the common thread. Um, one common thread is this mistrust of the communities and that's that resistance from the communities that disbelief that the disease is real, um, the, the many myths and, um, and, and stories that spread around uh, patients that were going, uh, were being kidnapped, their organs were being stolen, all these myths, all of that resistance was a big part, uh, probably the most significant part of why it took us so long to gain traction in West Africa and why today in DRC there is a crisis, and these are not my words, but of the um, of the professionals who are there right now that it is a disaster and still out of control. The important thing though is when we talk about mistrust of communities, it's often pretty easy to think about it as, oh, they have beliefs and they don't trust institutions and, uh, you know, so we need to give them information, etc. But mistrust goes both ways. It's not just the community's mistrust in the institutions and um, experts. It's our, the experts, mistrust in them and their ability to help us design solutions, help us find ways to tackle the problem. And we often go in uh, with the best intentions, saying we have the answer, let's roll this out. Um, and that, um, it, it, that not kind of stopping to listen and understand why do people believe what they believe, who will they be willing to listen to, what will make them change their behavior, et cetera, is really important. So trust goes both ways. I love that. Uh, yeah. Quickly, Elizabeth, when you launched the He for She movement, yes. uh, Edna referenced the fathers in the delivery room. This targeted men in these communities. You received pushback. Why do you think that was? And w give us the update on how, how that is going. No, so actually that was a very interesting uh, take because the pushback wasn't from men, surprisingly. Actually, the pushback was mostly from women. And I can also understand the pushback. I think most women felt that men were the problem. You know, men continue to hold women back. And I had to argue, and again, back to the thing that I said before, that I saw that the power brokers remain, continue to be men across all levels of society. So you can't really fix the problem if the people that are, you know, sort of creating some of this discomfort are not engaged in the conversation. But there was a pushback with women. And again, I think the important thing for us was to do exactly what you said, which was how do you create a movement and really put the ownership in the hands of the people with the privilege, which was men, to say, here's what you can do to become part of the solution, to become part of the change. And we literally saw in five days at least one man in every single country in the world who had committed to the He For She movement. But for me, what was interesting is this idea that we didn't tell the men what to do beyond simply saying, this is a movement, it's for you, and you can be a, a change agent, and you can be part of the solution. But we saw men become very creative. A man in my own country in Zimbabwe started a husband's school. He literally went around his village. He handpicked all the men that were abusive to their wives and said, underneath this tree, every Saturday, I'm going to teach you to become a better father and a better husband. And it was really, really remarkable. Another very quick story with Malawi. Malawi is one of the, the um, countries that's working with the He For She movement. The president made a commitment. Again, we said to him, 
you, you will know what the issues are for your own country. You will know how to solve for those issues. If sustainability is a component to the work we do as UN Women, which it is, we have to actually empower the local communities. And he decided that he was going to end child marriage. He, he then ended up you know, outlawing child marriage under the age of 18 as part of this his he for she commitment. It's now illegal in Malawi. But the big story for me is what happened at the community level where you saw the male chiefs start to join hands with the female chiefs who had been advocating to end child marriage for a very long time, but it was very difficult because the power brokers are still the men in those communities. And working together, one of our, our really sort of heartwarming story is that in the past 12 months, we saw the chiefs working together together, annulling 20,000 child marriages, and those girls are now back in school. That's how you engage the community. Uh, Gunit, we saw a clip from your incredible documentary, Period, End of Sentence, in our introduction video. And congratulations Yay, on you. winning thank an you. Academy Award. Thank you. Um, it has been so powerful in changing a global conversation about a basic bodily function, menstruation, not just in India, um, but again, around the world. Um, I brought something, not for you, but for this audience and for people watching around the world. <laughs> and uh, this is an idea for your next film because I know it was really about the pad movement, but I, I want to ask people watching, if this makes you uncomfortable here, now I'm a gynecologist, so this is my, this is my area, this is my jam. Uh, <laughs> Gunid, why, why did you set about making um, the film about menstruation and how have you seen this dialogue change, not just locally and socially, but politically as well? Um, it's been uh, an amazing journey of putting menstruation and a movie on menstruation on the map. Uh, thanks to Academy and to Netflix, we have an Oscar for a film uh, on menstruation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> Did you ever I mean, think that was going to happen? Actually, no. <laughs> we, uh, we, we, we set out, in fact, the girls from Oakwood School set out to make this, uh, and their English teacher set out to make this, trying to raise more money for one more pad machine that we can donate. And somewhere down the line, uh, they thought that while we are doing bake sales and yoga thons to raise one pad machine, why don't we also document the process of installing that and seeing what happens? It led to a revolution that got captured in the observatory doc documentary that we put together. I mean, now it's just cool to hang out with us. So, uh, As it so, should be. <laughs> so no, so I mean it politically because the girls from Hapur, um, they're being awarded by the local ministers because elections are on and the conversation about periods is comfortably happening from them lying and saying that we are setting up Huggies diaper unit when they started the pad project, when they started the pad machines, they could not tell their partners and husbands what they were actually putting in their own houses. To, uh, so they said we are making babies diapers and that is also part of the movie, it got captured as we interviewed the men. To then saying that you know we are, we are uh, setting up pad projects and this is what we do and we sell this, it's needed as a basic, basic hygiene every month for everyone. So. Uh, so, so the men are curious and are proud to be associated with it. We saw that shift uh, happen, at least in Hapur, in the village that we worked in, uh, with the help of our, um, with the help of the NGO Action India in Hapur. But the conversation is wide and it's uh, pan India, and it's on front paper of every newspaper of every channel, and it's normalizing. I mean, it's monthly. So congratulations. <laughs> Edna, um, I, wanna, I want everyone to take a look at this picture uh, because I think, as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. It's um, from one of your centers of an all-female surgical team. And I think that it's vital as we talk about these issues surrounding women's health and the health of communities, uh, including boys and men, you have to address the issue of capacity. Um, you have now trained, your hospital has trained more than 1,000 nurse midwives. Um, okay. 
and that in turn helps all of their communities as well. Uh, yes. First, explain to us what we're looking at here. You were telling me a little backstage, and, and how has your focus on midwifery in particular um, kind of been a, a yeah. portal of entry to this? Well, I want you to, to understand that this is a country where education for girls was not accepted. And to go to school in itself was a bad thing. So if you don't go to school, you cannot aim for a profession, you cannot train, you cannot acquire skills. And to be able to today have medical schools where 70% of the students are female, a country where we have been able to train a thousand midwives to send out throughout the country in itself is remarkable. And when I go into my operating theater and I see a senior female, a female surgeon assisted by another female surgeon, a female anesthetist, a female instrument nurse, a female supervisor in a hospital built by a female, and everybody combining their skills to save a little boy's life, Amazing. that's what education brings. And that's what I want for every country in the world. And if we've been able to train a thousand midwives in Somaliland, I need a million midwives in Somaliland. This week, it's Black Maternity Week. And we, need, we can only address maternal mortality if we train more midwives and make midwifery access, accessible to the underserved communities, wherever they are. And this makes it all worthwhile. Yeah. Absolutely. And when I think of the site where this operation is taking place is where people used to execute people. And I live on it. Forget about former first lady. That's been my address for the past 20 years. And it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. I feel blessed. And, and Edna, you, you have a memoir coming out later this year that I encourage people to look for. Shalini, we're, we have, this is the last question. We could speak about this all afternoon. Um, <laughs> you are very, very big on talking about a people-centered approach. You started with a virus-centered approach in your work um, against Ebola, people-centered approach. Just explain to us in the last two minutes what that means. Sure. Um, it, this is going to sound like the most obvious thing to say, but we forget it all the time. Viruses don't spread diseases, people spread diseases. Um, and that is um, one of the simplest things we forget when we think about epidemics and so on. We're so focused on the disease and how to solve the disease, we don't think about the people that it's affecting. And when we think about the people that it's affecting, we'll pause to listen and understand um, why they are behaving the way they are behaving who they will believe, um, you know, in Malawi, for instance, um, uh, maternal newborn health uh, was really helped in one village when a grandmother network uh, started giving the messages versus the doctors, um, right? So it's about really understanding people and their decision making. Um, and that means that we need to, in all of the work that we do, um, learn to listen and not assume based on observations. Um, when we look at a woman making a bad business decision, unless we actually get underneath why she's making the decision she's making, we don't know whether it's bad or not. Um, we need to create spaces for uh, women to network with other women. Um, we've seen this in multiple forums, including with uh, women entrepreneurs, where when a woman knows another woman, Data shows that she's much more likely to succeed in her business and much more likely to sustain that business. Just knowing another woman in business, right? Um, and then finally, we need to be willing to open up to get new voices and perspectives uh, into the mix. This is, the health debate is not just for um, public health specialists and doctors, it's for filmmakers and um, all, all anthropologists and private sector and everybody else. I think you all uh, are perfect examples of the saying that sometimes the messenger is really as important as the message. So I want to thank you all for the work you've done and for this incredible conversation. Thank you. Thank you.